morning. It's good to see you here today, and uh, there aren't a lot of empty seats, and there's still people coming in. So uh, if you have some seats in the middle, if you could make sure that there is access to them, that would be appreciated. I want to read one verse this morning as we begin, uh, and it ties in with what the theme of our messages are going to be over the next several weeks. And that is Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We as believers live in liberty. We live in freedom in Christ, and uh, we're going to examine over the next several weeks how that oftentimes we put ourselves back in bondage willingly. And uh, we allow sin to reign over us and cause us all sorts of grief. And so we're grateful that you're here today. And we trust that God will bless you and encourage you through our time of worship. And that you will leave here today rejoicing in the things of God. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for your love, your mercy, your grace. Father, we are undeserving but yet you showered upon us. And so this morning as we gather together corporately as a church, we lift up the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, we worship you, we adore you for all that you have done for us. God, help us to live in the liberty that you have provided for us. Help us to be a people who experience the victory that comes through Jesus Christ himself. Bless us, meet with us, Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. <coughs> Good morning and welcome. It's good to see you here this morning. And I think the sun is going to shine pretty soon. Well, if it doesn't, it's BC sunshine, I guess. Anyway, let's stand and sing at Calvary.
believe the songs you just sang? Amen. Because yeah. i got to tell you, I'm, one of these Sundays I'm going to invite individuals to come and stand beside me <laughs> during the song service. Oh, the bread of hope. <laughs> you all look like you've lost your best friend. We live in victory Amen. because of the grace of God and the mercy that's been extended to us. And I hope that you believe that this morning and that you're here to worship the one who's extended that grace to you. we got a few announcements to get through this morning, so let's get right to it. Uh, ladies Bible study on Tuesdays will take place this Tuesday. Uh, we have heat in the other end of the building. And uh, that's the first time this year. And we are excited. Uh, we're taking baby steps towards getting back to normal, but we're moving in the right direction. So ladies, Tuesday, 1 o'clock here at the church, examining Psalm 91 in God's protection. Wednesday evenings, we are wrapping up our study of Romans chapter 12, and uh, we're looking at verse 20 of that chapter. We encourage you to come and be a part of it. Uh, Bible study is good. Uh, it's a good opportunity for you to dig deeper into the scriptures. And uh, next Wednesday, uh, we are going to have a guest teacher. Uh, but this, the Wednesday after that, I will be beginning to go through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, we begin a new sermon series this morning on freedom from bondage and uh, living in the liberty and the freedom that Christ has given to us, and we encourage you to be here each Sunday for that. The Secret Sisters... After the service, Judy Cudney will be in the hallway. You'll know it's Judy because she'll be the only lady standing outside the ladies' room, all right, uh, by that little table. And uh, you can stop and talk to her and get an information package in relationship to our Secret Sisters uh, program that is going to be launching, I believe, very soon, okay? All right. January 16th, uh, our seniors ministry is canceled for this month because of the uh, fact that our kitchen is destroyed. Uh, so if you can be patient, we will announce and let you know when our next uh, seniors meeting will be. The Torchmen are going to be here on February the 12th at 6 p.m. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Torchmen, you know that you want to be here that evening. If you've never heard of the Torchmen, then you need to come, uh, because they are a blessing. And they are coming to us free of charge. We're going to take up a love offering that evening, but we're looking forward to their ministry and music with us on the 12th of February. All right, Dave, if you would come. Oh, no, don't, don't, don't. In fact, I'm going to ask the choir to come. I knew there was somebody coming. <laughs>
that children can be dismissed for junior church. And take your Bibles with you this morning and turn to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 1. If there's one thing that has become crystal clear to me over the years of my ministry and over the years that I've been a Christian, is that we are involved in spiritual warfare. The devil is not happy when an individual comes to faith in Christ, places their faith in his finished work, and accepts him as their personal savior. And the devil does everything in his power. We would love to be able to tell a new Christian that uh, life from here on out is going to be just a bed of roses. It's going to be peachy and everything's going to be great and you're never going to have problems again. Uh, but unfortunately, the reality is this, is that when you come to faith in Christ, you now move from the periphery into the bullseye of Satan's attacks. He is coming after you with everything that he can. Now I know that you came to church this morning to be encouraged. And you didn't come to hear how hard the Christian life is. But the reality is we have to face facts. We are beginning a series of messages this morning that I believe are very important. In not only in the life of this church, <coughs> but in our individual lives of the people that make up the church as a whole. Because if there's one thing I have seen, and I'm sure that you can bear witness to this as well, is that there are many Christians who live defeated lives day after day after day. They talk about victory in Jesus, and they talk about the peace and the joy and the excitement of the Christian life, and they talk about wanting the power of God on their lives, but if there's one thing that's true for most of us is that day after day we struggle with the same besetting sins over and over. We struggle with the same things that defeat us, that discourage us, that come after us and cause our lives to be miserable by times. There are different types of Christians. There are different types of people who profess the name of Jesus. The first type would be a type of people that say you only go around once, you need to enjoy life, and just do whatever feels good. And you say, well, that's not a very Christian attitude. Well, no, it's not. So let's use quotation marks when we talk about that group of people. There are the group of Christians who understand that there is spiritual warfare. And they live in fear constantly that the devil's coming after them. And they see demons behind every rock. Everything that goes wrong in their lives, they blame on the devil. Right? Remember, some of you are old enough to remember Flip Wilson and his character, Geraldine. And she always used to say, the devil made me do it. It's not always the devil. The reality is this, is that sometimes we have problems in our lives because we make dumb decisions. Right? Will you, will you agree with that statement? Yeah. Not you, but the person beside you. They make dumb decisions. Amen. <laughs> Do we not check IDs at the door? <laughs> Then there's, those two types of Christians would be on polar extremes. Then there is the type of Christian in the middle that understands we're in spiritual warfare, and they desperately long for the power of God in their life. And they want God to give them the strength and the power to overcome the enemy as he seeks to attack them. As we go through these next several weeks, I want us to see a few things that I think are important. First of all, I want you to see that victory is possible. 
Victory in the Christian life is not an unattainable pie in the sky dream that somebody thought of years ago. But it is possible in your life to live in the victory of Jesus Christ. I want us to see that God not only is able to give us victory, but he delights in giving his people victory. But yet many live in bondage. At the time that our text was written, Egypt was the superpower of the world. And God, as only God can do, performed some amazing feats and miracles to deliver his people Israel from the bondage that they were in in Egypt. Exodus chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, says this. Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren and all that generation and the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join against unto uh, they join unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Father, I pray this morning, as we come to this passage of scripture, to this particular subject that we are looking at, God help us to pay attention to what you have for us. Help us, Father, to lay aside all of the things that may occupy our mind in this moment. And help us to be open to what the Holy Spirit of God has for us today. God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your love that we cannot fully comprehend. And Father, I pray that you would help us. That we would live in the victory that has been provided for us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, open our eyes and our understanding today. Speak to us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. As we look at the story of Israel's deliverance, their enslavement, and all of the problems that they went through, I want us to see just a few important things this morning. The first thing I want us to notice is that they lived in a hateful culture. Israel was in bondage to Egypt. And the Egyptians, though they benefited from Israel's labor, the Egyptians despised the Jews. They hated them with every ounce of their being. And they tried desperately to make life miserable for the Jewish people. But even though Israel was in bondage, they were growing. God was blessing them, and they were multiplying, and they were filling the land. And so suddenly there arises a new pharaoh, a new king over Egypt, one that did not know Joseph. Now, if you recall, back when Joseph was on the scene, Joseph was a very well-loved and respected man in Egypt. And he rose to the position of second in command of all of the nation of Egypt, even as a Jew. Because God was with him and God had blessed him abundantly. And Egypt benefited from Joseph's involvement and in leadership. But now a new king has arisen. One that did not know Joseph. 
that did not remember all that had been done and how Joseph had blessed the nation, or God had blessed the nation through Joseph. And so now the king looks upon Israel as an intimidating group of people. They're getting out of hand. They're getting too big. They're becoming too powerful. And they have got to be kept under control. This king was unfamiliar with the history of the nation of Egypt. There were many dynasties through the uh, history of Egypt. And it was during the 17th dynasty, the Hiskos dynasty, that Joseph came and became popular and became second in command. But in the 18th dynasty, the new king began to rule with a heavy fist, an iron fist, if you will. And he began to make life miserable for God's people. He was unfamiliar with Joseph, and he was unfamiliar with the stories of the plagues. And uh, uh, Am I getting ahead of myself? I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, he was unfamiliar with how God had blessed the nation and gotten them through the famine. And so he viewed these people as a problem. I think it's good for us to remember, and we don't need a lot of reminding right now, but we live in a hateful culture as well. We live in a culture that despises Christianity, that despises the moral code that we live by, the word of God that we hold dear, and look upon us as bigots, as people who are intolerant, when in fact the opposite is actually true because we as God's people are ruled by the love of Christ. But yet the world as it is commanded by the God of this world hates the cause of Christ and everything that comes with it. Someone has said that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. History is sometimes ugly, but history brings with it lessons that prevent us from repeating past mistakes. We have come through and we are still in the age of woke, where the world thinks that they have suddenly awoken to what is right and good and proper Everything that's been done in the past is wrong. And they've torn down statues from the Civil War. They've torn down Robert E. Lee and, and even defaced Abraham Lincoln. And sure, folks, I, I'll, I'll grant you this, that these men are not men to be worshipped. But they are men that bring with them lessons that we need to remember. That we need to to keep at the forefront of our minds lest we make the same mistakes that, that others have made. And that's exactly what's going on here in Egypt, is that history has been totally erased and forgotten, and now Joseph has come, or, or this new king has come on the scene, and he is going to make sure that this nation of Israel knows who the boss is. Not only was this new king unfamiliar with Joseph, but he was unfamiliar with Jehovah. The Pharaoh at this time was an idolater. He was serving many gods. In fact, the reason that God would one day judge Egypt was in no small part because of the fact that they were idolaters. And the fact that they were causing his people problems. Exodus chapter 5 and verse 2 says, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. He did not remember Joseph, and he did not know the Lord. Our nation today is in that same place. Our leaders are removing the Ten Commandments from public places, disallowing prayer in the public schools, 
seeking to remove remembrances of God in every arena of our lives. Spiritually speaking, folks, we are living in Egypt at this moment. Because of that opportunity, because of the fact that that is indeed taking place in our lifetime, in our nation, we have a great opportunity to declare the glory of God, to live out our faith, to be God's people in a world that does not know him. Psalm 96 and verse 3 says, Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all the people. Never forget in your seasons of bondage, in your times of struggle, in those moments when you feel like throwing in the towel and giving up because victory seems to be unattainable, that God is calling on you to declare his glory, to live out your faith and to live it before a lost world in the midst of a pagan culture. Not only was he unfamiliar with Joseph and unfamiliar with God, but he was also unfair with the nation of Israel. Exodus chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, if you'll look there with me. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join against our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. The king here is not suggesting to the nation that they recognize Israel for some accolade and, and, and try to appease them and be friendly with them. What he is introducing is the concept of, of violent oppression, of causing Israel to come into subservience, to have an attitude of submission to the nation of Israel. And I think that that's true in the world in which we live today. I think the devil is trying his best to discourage Christians and trying to get Christians to the point that they say, you know what, I'm, I just give up, I, you know. Let me get the white flag out and let me wave it because I give up. Folks, we cannot throw in the towel. We cannot give up. We cannot believe the devil's lies that victory is not possible in my Christian life. That others may enjoy it and others may have it and, and it may be good for them, but I just can't do it. And, and so I'm just going to give up even trying. We live in a world that is anti-God, but we serve a God that is able to do the impossible. He is able to accomplish and do anything that he wishes to do. Previous pharaohs had accepted and welcomed the children of Israel and even encouraged leadership among them. But this pharaoh was motivated by fear and became mean and intolerant toward the children of Israel. Look at verses 13 and 14 of chapter 1. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. The phrase with rigor means with harshness or with severity. Egypt became cruel taskmasters. They became abusive and mean and hard and difficult to deal with. Israel was under severe persecution at this time, and they were suffering greatly. And you may feel like you're in the exact same spot in your life at this moment in time, but if you look back and look at the history of Israel, you will find that God had a purpose in it. And I believe that it applies to our lives in this day and age as well. It may be difficult, it may be hard, it may be discouraging, it may be to the point that you have had all you can take, but God has a purpose. Amen. And God is still on the throne. Amen. And God has not abandoned you. And God will see you through. Amen. 
Amen. We said Wednesday night in the Bible study that God's books are not balanced in October. God does not settle all the accounts at the time that we think he should. God will one day settle each and every account. And everything will be made right. And all the wrongs will be erased. But that time is not yet. That time is yet to come. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 20 says, But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of this iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as ye are this day. It was hard for Israel. I mean, it was hard. We think we've got it difficult when we have no heat in the Sunday school wing. We're a bunch of softies. We're mamby pambies. We don't have it as hard as this nation did. Isaiah 48 verse 10 says, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. This life that you are living right now is a challenging and difficult life. And there's no other way to paint it. There's no other way to describe it. Life can be downright hard by times. But God is still God. Do you realize that the 88 strings on a concert piano exert over 45,000 pounds of pressure on the frame? That is over 22 tons of pressure on the frame of the piano. This pressure, however, is needful so that beautiful music can be produced on that piano. Similarly, the pressure in our lives can be the very thing that God uses to bring about beauty, to bring about a shining testimony of his grace and goodness. So they lived in a hateful culture, but they also lived in a harmful culture. When you think, feel that you can't live for God anymore, in the midst of the world in which we are surrounded, remember how God worked in the lives of the Hebrew children. Sometimes cultures that are hateful to the things of God can also become very harmful to the people of God. The people of God are targeted and they are attacked time and time again. And the world takes out its animosity against God on his people. Pharaoh realized that his plan to destroy the current generation of Jews by hard labor was not working. So then he plotted against future generations. And as we read in verses 15 and 16, he came up with a new plan. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the same uh, the name of the one was Shipra, and the name of the other Pua. And he said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. So he's come up with a harmful plot now to destroy future generations of Jews. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. God had a plan, and that plan included a little baby boy that was yet to be born, and that baby's name was Moses. And God protected Moses. Do you realize today that our nation, our culture in which we are living, is obsessed with abortion? 19% of all pregnancies in the United States of America end in abortion. 879,000 babies are murdered each year through abortion. Approximately 2,400 are killed every day. Over 61 million babies have been aborted from the time that Roe versus Wade ruling was made in 1973 until the Supreme Court just this last year struck down that law. 58% of Americans believe that abortion 
should be legal and it is a woman's right to choose. We're living in a hateful culture. We're living in a harmful culture. But there is a higher perspective. Look at verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them but saved the men children alive. Praise the Lord, there were a select few that refused to go along with the culture of their day and do what was accepted by Egypt. Mm -hmm. But they stood for what was right. They feared God, they respected God, and they did the right thing. G.K. Chesterton said this. He said, we fear men so much because we fear God so little. One fear cures another. Did you get that? We fear men so much because we fear God so little. The more we fear God, the more we will stand against what this world is doing and what they're trying to accomplish. But the church today is overwhelmed by fear. Fear of the world. Fear of what people will think. Fear of, of what the government's going to do. We would rather obey God than man. The fear of the Lord changes our hearts and our actions because it is reverent awe for God that motivates us. Because of the midwife's decision, they were blessed greatly by God. Verses 20 and 21 of chapter 1. Therefore God dealt, dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. Okay, they were blessed greatly of God. We see thirdly, that even though they lived in a hateful culture and a harmful culture, that they were extended a helpful hand. In the midst of the bondage, in the midst of the hate, God always makes a way of escape. You say, well, Pastor, how does that apply to my inability to experience victory in my Christian life? Pay attention, because we're coming to the tie-in. God always makes a way for you to experience victory. For you to have his blessing and his power on your life. We do not have it many times because we do not seek it. We do not want it bad enough. We don't fear God enough. We don't seek after him enough. But God blessed Israel. Because there were some who were seeking to do the right thing. In the background, as all of this is taking place, God is preparing a man that would be used to lead Israel out. In the midst of all of the problems, a Hebrew couple gave birth to a baby boy. You ever heard anybody say, uh, in the world in which we're living, you know, I, I, I fear for parents who are bringing babies into this world. What's it going to be like for those children 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now? Maybe it's your child that God is, is raising up. God has chosen, has protected, and will indeed use one day. That Hebrew couple that gave birth to Moses had no idea that he would one day be the man that God would use to lead his people out of bondage. God is always at work. God is always preparing a way. God has always given us the ability to make decisions. The problem is, is that sometimes we make the wrong decision. Oh, for, forgive me. Let me correct that. A lot of times we make the wrong decision. Not sometimes. A lot of times. 
Pastor, I just can't experience victory in my life. Are you reading your Bible? Well, no, because because the only time I have free is when that soap opera's on, and I I gotta watch it. Are you praying? Are you seeking God? Are you being obedient to, to what God has already told you to do? God is at work, but God expects his people to be obedient to what he has revealed to us to do and be. Life brings periods of time in which you may feel as though everything is out of control. You may feel that, that there's no way you can make sense of anything that is taking place in your life right now. Everything may seem to be cloudy and, and the skies are dark and you feel that you have no control and no ability and, and you can't see what's taking place. But God is still working. God is still blessing. God is still fulfilling his plan. Amen. He is still sovereign. He is still a providential God. He is still in control of the affairs of men and women. And he knows how things are going to play out. Amen. We have been delivered just as Israel was by the grace of God. God's grace has swept in over our lives and has given us that which we do not deserve, and that is forgiveness, and that is grace, and that is, for, that is mercy, and, and that is freedom in Christ, and that is liberty, and that is the joy that passes all understanding, and that is the peace of God. He's given us all those things, mm -hmm. but the devil doesn't want you to live with the peace of God in your life. He doesn't want you to live with the joy of the Lord overwhelming you. He doesn't want you to experience victory. And so he daily will attack you and seek to defeat you and discourage you and tell you all sorts of lies in your ear. We need to stop listening to the devil. Start listening to what God has to say. Amen. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am forgiven. I am redeemed. I am a child of God. I have a bright future in heaven. Amen. And friends, he can't come soon enough. Amen. We, as God's people, need to tell the devil that he's a loser. Amen. Somebody said to me this morning, and I've read it several times, that when the devil tells me of my past, I need to remind him of his future. And the devil will bring up your past time and time again. I heard someone say just a week or so ago that you can't tell me who I used to be because I'm not that man anymore. I'm forgiven and I have moved on. I don't live there. So when the devil tries to tell you that you have, have been a loser and you have, you have let God down and you have been defeated time and time again, don't believe what he says. It may not be wrong. Maybe we have. And, and folks, it's same with me. I'm there with you. But God's forgiven me. Amen. And God, in his grace, has delivered me. Amen. And none of us here today need to live in defeat. We can experience the victory that comes through following Jesus Christ, through loving him and obeying him. And that's what this series is about. And when this series is done, we're going to launch into another series, which is Who I Am in Christ, so that each of us know who we are in Jesus Christ. So when the devil does lie to us, we don't believe it. 
Because we can go to the Bible and we can point to Scripture and we can say, this is who I am in Christ. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your grace and your mercy, for your goodness, for your love, for your patience. God, help us as your people understand that we have already been forgiven and we are living in liberty in Christ. Why would we seek again to be in bondage? Lord, help us not to believe what the devil says, but rather help us to go to your word, to read what you say about us, Father, help us to understand clearly that we have been delivered by grace. We don't live there anymore. Father, I pray that you bless us in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing in closing. Just so sweet to trust in Jesus. <laughs> Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.